She's such a groovy lady. She makes my heart go hidey hidey. Hi, I'm Audrey Cadry the world's oldest member of Gen Z. I was born in 1997, when the show Frasier was airing its fourth season. People my age or younger may not be familiar with the show, but I do recommend it. In fact, this is the only TV show I've watched since November of 2020. Yep, now I'm not a master of comedy or film slash TV show analyzer, but I have watched this show all the way through over and over again for over a year, so I'm pretty well acquainted with it. So, because I have amassed a good chunk of knowledge and opinions about this TV show, I thought I'd volunteer myself to guide you through this deep dive into Frasier. Frasier is a critically acclaimed American sitcom, which premiered on September 16th, 1993 and ran until May of 2004. It was created by David Angel, Peter Casey, and David Lee. It's a spin-off of the show Cheers, which ran from 1982 to 1993 and is regarded as one of the most successful spin-off shows ever created. Now disclaimer, I have not seen Cheers. Everything I know about Cheers comes from references and cameos on Frasier. So just keep in mind that my analysis and opinions are coming from a person who has only seen Frasier 87 times. Another disclaimer, this video won't be spoiler free. I have a lot of things I want to discuss and I will go into detail and it's hard to do that without spoilers. So if you're interested in watching this show spoiler free, go ahead and do that and then come back to this video. So without further ado, let's dive into Frasier. This is my Daphne outfit. I'm just doing a little like, what is this called? Portrait mode. So you guys can actually see the skirt because with the framing of the, like the video, you can't really see the skirt. When Daphne wears this outfit, she usually has like a brooch on her chest. I forgot to pick it up. So instead I pinned a key blade to my chest. <laughs> Daphne would be into Kingdom Hearts. Okay, I, I fully believe that, so. Listen to yourself, Bob. You follow her to work. You eavesdrop on her calls. You open her mail. The minute you started doing these things, the relationship was over. Thank you for your call. You don't understand. You see, it's not the same as dad being wrong or you're being wrong. I have a degree from Harvard. Whenever I am wrong, the world makes a little less sense. <laughs> Frasier is our main character, played by Kelsey Grammer. The eldest son of the Crane family, Frasier is a psychiatrist and radio show host at KACL. When the show opens, he has just moved from Boston back to his hometown of Seattle following his divorce. Frasier reconnects with his father and brother and tries to make a fresh start for himself as a newly single man. Frasier has a lot of qualities. Maybe I'll let some of the other characters list his characteristics. Oh, uh, uh, snippy. Snippy. Sarcastic. Mm -hmm. Bossy. Huffy. Vain. Oh, 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 well, how nice we finally found an activity we can all enjoy together. You'll be fine. You'll bounce back. You're tough. And resourceful. Resilient. Optimistic. Tenacious. Conceited. Different list, Daph. He's the kind of person that I wouldn't like to meet, but I do enjoy watching him on the show. Does that mean? I just don't really like, that's the thing. I love this show, but I also recognize that Frasier as a person is kind of unlikable, <laughs> but like he's charming, he's endearing. He's pretentious, he's a snob, he has a flair for the dramatic, he loves to nitpick and he's stubborn to a fault. He also has a huge case of oldest sibling syndrome, thinks his word is gospel, tries to control others, drawn to leadership roles, complicated relationship with parents. I wouldn't know anything about that. He also speaks French too much. Most episodes center around Fraser's pride, snobbery, or stubbornness getting him into trouble. Like in season seven, when he requests that a restaurant put a caricature of him up on the wall and then doesn't like it and requests to change it three times. His endless pursuit of perfection and the need to preserve his image often leads to his downfall. There's an episode where he and his brother think that because they know food and know wine and have style, taste, and refinement, they can just buy a failing restaurant and bring it back to life. Have you decided what you'd like? Yes, I'd like the whole damn place, right from the wine cellar to the rafters. And for the lady? <laughs> They're so caught up in how it'll boost their reputation that they completely gloss over the hard work that goes into running a restaurant. Frasier is a man of extreme emotions and even more extreme reactions. He is prone to the tantrum. Where's my paper? Who stole my paper? Mrs. Everly, you old bad, I know it's you. People of Seattle! Listen to me! We are not barbarians! We are not Neanderthals! And we are not French! His tendency to bulldoze over the other characters combined with his passionate lectures means he's a force to be reckoned with when upset. You note the time on your watch. This is it! 
Explanation, please! <laughs> At least in terms of verbal combat, he's actually kind of a wimp. Also, until season three, he has terrible hair. A driving force behind Fraser's actions is his strong sense of ethics. Although a lot of his actions are questionable and selfish, there are some rules that he won't bend, such as lying under oath in a later season. And your answer would be? Yes. No, 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 the answer is not to the best of my recollection, but I do recall and I'll be under oath. Oh, please not this again. Both Fraser and his brother have intense reactions to breaching their ethics. Niles will get nosebleeds and Fraser will throw up. In the first season, Fraser advises a man who calls into his show to break up with his girlfriend. When Fraser later meets and dates that woman, he gets nauseous when they try to sleep together. <laughs> On the other hand, Fraser's uncompromising nature means he's also kind of a Karen, such as when he follows this guy behind the counter in the coffee shop because he was served a day old scone. Both he and his brother Niles are Karens. They seem to take pleasure in imposing impossible standards on service workers. How was your dinner? It was fine, except for one small flaw. Oh, just the way you like it. Fraser even goes so far as to resent service workers for things like being late to an appointment and inconveniencing him. He spends a whole episode blocking the exit to a parking garage because he refuses to pay $2 to leave, despite given multiple chances to leave without paying. He can't stand the idea of the other motorists thinking they have bested him. They'll think they've gotten the better of me or that I'm afraid to be arrested. The bigger person doesn't worry about what other people think. Damn! I do want to be the bigger person, it's just so hard. Fraser tends to go to extremes for what he believes in, no matter how ridiculous those extremes end up being. To quote Fraser himself, he's passionate and right, and passionate about being right. Male Karens should just be called Frasers. Fraser is an easy target for pranksters and bullies. He's pranked by Bulldog, another radio personality, more than once. Well, you have my sympathy. There is nothing more irritating than pointless and pretentious erudition. My advice to you is to uh, simply avoid him. Is that possible? Not really, you bloody wallaby. You're on right before me. <laughs> This prank call style is done again with Carlos and the chicken, and surprisingly, Bulldog's jokes are better and less problematic. Fraser doesn't really seem to have a sense of humor about himself. He takes himself way too seriously, which draws others to want to make him look ridiculous so they can draw a reaction out of him. And Fraser falls into that trap time and again, exploding in a self-righteous monologue. The lusting for blood like a barbarian. I have a more civilized approach in mind. I have composed a speech. <laughs> He also just isn't a very funny man himself, in the sense that he struggles to make others laugh. Often when he tells jokes, they're followed by an uncomfortable silence. Oh, wait, I've got one. Who do you suppose the monkey will get to defend him? Clarence Darrow? <laughs> Some of my favorite episodes kind of analyze Frasier's psyche. In one episode, Fraser is receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award, which obviously causes him to reflect on his life and his achievements. Fraser fixates on a note sent with flowers from a former mentor of his, and so he visits him, kind of looking for answers. Fraser? What the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> Fraser admits to feeling kind of empty, probably that he doesn't deserve this Lifetime Achievement Award. My point is that at the age of eight, at eight, you began to use psychiatry as a way to deal with a world that scared you to death. And this Lifetime Achievement Award has made you realize that your career is finite. And once it's gone, all you'll have left is that frightened eight-year-old boy. Frazier tends to mostly deal with the mind and more like hands-off logical sense than with the heart and like emotions. Perhaps caller, if we reframe the issue, we can- Redefining the problem, deal with the feelings. I can suggest certain visualization techniques. He knows them already. Look, if he knows all this, then why is he calling? He told you, because he's empty. Keep going. Well, uh, sometimes it helps to, to write yourself a letter. He's already got himself on the phone. <laughs> but I don't know what he wants. Then why do you keep trying to bury him in psychiatric exercises? Because that's all I have. 
Frasier eventually loses his job and loses the jobs of everyone at KSEL pretty spectacularly, is so in denial over this that the whole episode is structured through the stages of grief. And by the end, he has to kind of be shocked out of denial by Niles. Frasier, you're not famous anymore. <laughs> and has the most incredible tantrum I've ever seen from the man. <laughs> That's probably enough now. Okay. Dr. Cooley, my Moon had a saying. What are you trying to do, kid? His whole identity had been centered around his career and his popularity and celebrity. So losing that uh, was quite a big blow for Fraser. The biggest reason why Fraser Crane is such an entertaining character is Kelsey Grammer's performance. His over-the-top projections and emotional outbursts. To this day, there is a, a sucking chest wound. <laughs> Where once there dwelled a heart. Diane. And screw, may I add, you. I was thinking we could have that meeting next Tuesday. We have met. <laughs> And even just the way Fraser speaks, the Fraser accent is amusing. I guess Niles's is too. He's he kind of speaks the same way. It's amazing to me that Fraser's character is still so full of life, even in the last few seasons. Keep in mind, Kelsey Grammer had been playing this character for years by the time the spin-off show started. In fact, here is David Hyde Pierce on Kelsey Grammer's performance. Is that a good thing? I mean, for an actor to play a part that long? I mean, it's good and bad, I guess. I'll tell you, if it's Kelsey Grammer, it's a good thing mm -hmm. because he actually has the resources as an actor to continue surprising you 20 years into a character he does he still makes us laugh mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of actors would be phoning it in by year 10 let alone by year 20 but uh, he's got the goods so we're glad the elements that kelsey Grammer combined and the efforts of the writers obviously creating this character formed a timeless charming man that kept us watching season after season hello linda i'm listening twitched his tail for two minutes. That's because he's lulling him into a false sense of security. <laughs> the most dangerous part of a gecko is its mind. <laughs> Martin, or Marty Crane, is played by John Mahoney. He is Frasier's father and my favorite character. The first episode centers on Frasier's complicated relationship with him, something that is revisited and developed throughout each season. Martin was a police officer for 30 years when a gunshot wound to the hip forced him to retire and later move into Frasier's apartment. I'm sorry that my, I kind of have a whistle sometimes when I say my S's, so when I say Frasier, it whistles. <laughs> Martin is down to earth, snarky, old fashioned, a stark contrast to his sons, especially Fraser. It's asking me to enter my six digit access code. What'll I do? Why don't you just punch in whatever keys spell out snobby? <laughs> Martin is a homebody, he likes things to stay the same, and he's usually a good judge of character. He's stubborn, grumpy, and you can usually find him watching TV. He's usually the one to guilt trip other characters, especially using his age to manipulate them into doing things for him. I don't do some other time. I'm sure Daphne's got something in the fridge I can heat up. He also likes to cause a little chaos now and then, and is very attached to that damn chair. Martin is very much a sports-watching, beer-drinking kind of guy, a stark contrast to his sons, who stick to opera and wine. Frazier and Niles tend to think themselves and their tastes superior to their fathers, such as in the episode where they attempt to introduce Martin to the finer things in life. You know, Niles, maybe it's time we tried to pay him back in some way, expose him to some of the finer things so that He'd stop lumbering through life like some great polyester dinosaur. <laughs> Frazier and Niles tend to underestimate Martin's intelligence. Although Frazier and Niles are trained psychiatrists, they often leap headfirst into harebrained schemes, which Martin advises against. Martin is often the one to know how to better navigate social situations, such as convincing the other talent to side with the workers when there's a strike. After all this, well, she won't have to worry about the support staff backing you guys up, will she? Oh, but no, that's crazy. I'm not suggesting that Kate might be coming after our money next. No, she wouldn't do that. She's a peach, right? Soft as a cream puff. And we all know no one here is overpaid. Suddenly I'm feeling very Norma Ray. <laughs>
Martin knows his sons underestimate him and sometimes uses this to his advantage. With a few well-timed comments, he gets Daphne and Niles to clean the apartment and make dinner for him, all without leaving his chair. Are you sure you don't want to stick around? I was just going to open a can of spaghetti. <laughs> but you have sea bass in the fridge. Oh, it'll probably last another day. Oh, I think you should cook it tonight. Oh, what am I supposed to do? Well, just take one clove of garlic, uh, two tablespoons of finely minced fresh ginger. Oh, for heaven's sake, I'll do it myself. I suppose I'll lay the table. No, no, Daphne, you've done enough for today. That's Fraser's job. He seems kind of lazy, but I mean, he is retired and he's got a bad hip, but he's also the advocate for hard work and not taking any shortcuts. Despite how often they butt heads, Martin is very proud of his sons and resents any implication that he's disappointed in them. So I guess if I had to pick my two biggest disappointments. You stop right there. You will not put these words in my mouth. I was always proud of you boys and I will not be portrayed as some drunken, judgmental jackass. He has trouble expressing his emotions, especially saying the phrase, I love you. It's obvious that he doesn't understand his sons and wishes they had more overlapping interests, but he takes great pride in their achievements. Throughout the show, Martin's gruff exterior begins to soften, and he has some very real bonding moments with both Frasier and Niles. In the first season, he's hesitant to enter back into the dating scene again because he's still uncomfortable with the idea of becoming close with someone who's not his late wife. Martin ends up with Frasier childhood babysitter who is a great match for him. I think what draws me to Martin as a character the most is his contentment with the small and simple things in life. Martin spends his time playing with his pet, hanging out with his buddies, and avoiding exercise. And I can relate to that. He's the kind of character who makes you feel at home. He's the regular guy that you can relate to, who you can see yourself drinking a beer with while watching game show reruns on TV. His wit is as sharp as his son's, and his wisdom, though sometimes underappreciated in the moment, can be recognized in retrospect. Come on, grab an ant. <laughs> oh, you're serious? You know I don't lift. Yeah. With that stick where it is, I'm surprised you can bend. Niles is portrayed by David Hyde Pierce, who I believe is one of the best actors on the show, rivaling Kelsey Grammer. Niles is skittish, neurotic, and anxious, and somehow even snobbier than Fraser. The kind of guy to tweeze a muffin and wipe down a public chair. He's incredibly successful in his field, but is always stuck in his brother's shadow. He's refined, sometimes a little creepy, we'll talk about that, but otherwise a very lovable character. Some of the best jokes are his ridiculously transparent excuses to be near Daphne. What's in the bag? Uh, just a little treat I picked up for Dad. Some Devonshire clotted cream. For Dad? I love Devonshire clotted cream. Isn't that lucky you took and share it? He's kind of a pushover. Niles seems to think that if he's patient enough, things will work out. Well, this offends him, so he starts pulling up Maris's prized camellias by the handful. Well, I couldn't stand for that, so I marched right into the morning room and locked the door until he cooled down. <laughs> Niles allows Frasier to be the straight man to Niles' stuffiness. Usually Frasier is the stuffy one and the other characters react to him. It'll give you a chance to see the Tacoma Dome. I've already seen it. They had a home show there once. <laughs> you know, that's where I got that idea to stencil a grape arbor on our Welch dresser. I'm a teamster compared to you. <laughs> Niles and Frasier also have a pretty intense rivalry. It seems like they're always in this battle of constant one-upmanship. Niles spends a lot of time in Frasier's shadow and can't contain his jealousy when Frasier's celebrity is brought up. Happy Frasier Crane Day. <laughs> or is it Merry Frasier Crane Day? I can never remember. You know, I wanted to be a psychiatrist like Mom way before you did, but because you were older, you got there first. You were first to get married. You were first to give dad the grandchild he always wanted. By the time I get around to doing anything, it's all chewed meat. He is fiercely competitive with Fraser, and they are downright hostile to each other as things escalate. Still, it's weird to see so much hostility between the brothers. They really jump down each other's throat, stab each other in the back. <laughs> especially when it's something that has to do with their social standing. Niles is also pretty passive aggressive. Something Niles lacks and eventually develops is the courage to stand up for himself and voice his needs and boundaries. We learn anecdotally that both Fraser and Niles were heavily bullied as children. There I was, your little brother, hanging naked from a goalpost and everyone was standing around laughing and all Coach Medwick would do was stand there going, whatever that means. 
Niles has a lot of repressed anger from those childhood traumas, as indicated when he is confronted with his childhood bully and tries to shove the man's head into a toilet. Another theme is his pining over Daphne, who he falls in love with in the first season. He has a debilitating attraction to her and intense jealousy over her romantic interests. You're always distrustful. You're always suspicious. Sometimes you just have to have faith that people are all right. What's he doing now? <laughs> I believe he's bagging her beans. Oh. Niles is very rational, and although his lifeless marriage to Maris would prompt him to leave her and pursue Daphne, he doesn't. In Niles' marriage to Maris, Niles is incredibly loving and patient. He caters to her every need, frequently setting aside his own needs and wants to satisfy Maris. He will also defend Maris when his family members remark about her oddities. At least I don't have to live with something unattractive. Maris walks all over him during their marriage and continues to manipulate him during their separation and divorce. She always puts her needs above his. She never attends family functions. Doesn't that make you angry? Well, over the years, I've learned to accept Maris's eccentricities. Oh, she's not being eccentric. She's being arrogant and selfish. If he says he's not angry, he's not angry. And even if I were angry, what would you have me do? Let it out. Well, I am letting it out. I'm getting hives. <laughs> Niles truly deserves better. Maris, unfortunately, has quite a hold on him. Maris has changed. She now understands that she cannot control me. I am my own man. I don't actually respond to that. It's a little joke we have between us. Okay, that means business. <laughs> Despite how horribly she treats him, he's jealous of the lovers that she takes after their separation and tries to reconcile with her several times until he discovers that their marriage counselor is also having an affair with Maris. Maris? This is the final straw for Niles, and after seasons of untangling himself from Maris's web, he's finally had enough. How many hours I have spent pleading with that woman through gates, through windows, through keyholes and through transoms and in one disastrous instance through the pet door. I decided no more. I actually looked up at the house and said, goodbye, Maris. I hope you have a happy life, but I don't have to take any more of your crap ever again. And I turned on my heel and walked away. That's a courageous decision. How do you feel? Not bad, surprisingly. What's interesting is I actually read Niles was kind of created as who Frazier would have been if he had never left Seattle. Niles is one of the best actors on the show. His delivery gets me every time. You're jealous of my celebrity? It's not a tantrum and I'm not jealous. I'm just fed up! Marrying money can have its perils. 10 or 15 years down the line after you've adapted to a lifestyle now totally beyond your means, you can find yourself cast aside a hollow husk, penniless and crushed. <laughs> Being polite, I kept my tongue sheathed until he referred to Bernstein's conducting as overrated. I assume you pounced. Like a ninja. <laughs> Actually, I even showed her my rarely seen collection of 18th century Portuguese bud faces. <laughs> and how did she react? Well, if you must know, she was rather aroused. She said she loved a man who collected porcelain and, oh my God, I'm dating a whore. <laughs> Niles' delivery and presence, as well as his character arcs, make him one of the most iconic characters on the show. Oh, hello. Caught me with me hand in the biscuit tin. I'm Daphne. Daphne Moon. Fraser, she's phenomenal. It's a gift. Well, cheerio. Ta-ta. Daphne Moon, played by Jane Leaves, is kooky, psychic, and plays the down-to-earth foil or opposite to Niles' refined snobbery. She's Martin's home health care worker, but also takes on the role of housekeeper and emotional laborer. Her life before moving in with Fraser and Martin is pieced together from weird snatches of her backstory. Daphne has a tendency to launch into bizarre stories about her childhood, um, which she recounts happily and the other characters tolerate. Until that year, the spring thaw set in her and poor Michael went right through the ice. Oh, they caught hell for that one, they did. Caught it worse a week later when Michael's toe finally fell off. Michael cried and cried until they told him to put it under his pillow for the toe fairy. <laughs> then when he got five quid,
quid for it, why, it was all they could do to stop him from sawing off the rest of them. <laughs> What's keeping you guys with that box? Daphne and Martin are also a great duo. From the hints about Daphne's past, we learn that she had a troubled home life, and her parents are a real piece of work. Daphne's father is a deadbeat alcoholic, and Daphne's mother is the devil. Martin kind of becomes the parent that Daphne never had, and they become quite close. Daphne is a kind but tough addition to the family. She will voice her opinions and stand up for herself. She's often the buffer between Frasier and Martin. You gotta come with us. Why? Well, Frasier and I don't have anything to talk about. I, I always feel more comfortable if there's somebody else around or the TV's blaring. Daphne is also very trusting of people. She's also shown to be very patient. I Means she does live with Frasier and Martin for years, goodness gracious. I think Daphne is just so at home with the Cranes and her role in the household that she never really looks for anything better. She has everything that she wants and needs. Although she could be paid more. Daphne is the, in the main cast, but she's not really focused on very much, especially because she is kind of the object that Niles is pining over. We don't spend as much time in Daphne's head. Many scenes with Daphne are spent viewing her through the lens of Niles' affection for her. That's why I do love episodes that are a little more Daphne-centric or focus on her because I just want to know more about her as a character. Daphne's cheerfulness and positive attitude through the hardships she's weathered seem to be her main coping mechanism. Kind of a little bit toxic positivity, but it works for her. She often recalls memories that are unpleasant and just talks about them cheerfully. But my mum would always say, enjoy it while you can. There'll be no water in hell. Of course, that was her answer for everything. Eat your veggies, there'll be no Brussels sprouts in hell. Have a lie down, there'll be no naps in hell. Daphne, I am a therapist. Uh, I'd like to talk about this sometimes. About what? <laughs> I'm also kind of sad that as the series goes on, Daphne's kookiness is toned way down. I miss the weird Daphne. Daphne's also shown in later seasons to have a lot of pent up anger. And there is an episode where she is absolutely pushed to the brink. You threw all my wet clothes all over the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize they were still wet. Here, let me help. What are you doing? Ooh, that's nice and hot. Stop it, what? No. Stop it! Maybe if we air dried them. That should do it. You're happy now. She kind of like waits on the men hand and foot, serving them dinner, answering the door, doing laundry, which I hate. Like Daphne should get to sit down and like drink wine and watch TV, like at least sometimes. No, all the time, she deserves the best. From what we know about her backstory, she kind of settles into this role because she did it as a child. I knew he'd never use it on me, as long as I was always good, as long as I was always polite, as long as I always had a smile on my face, no matter how I felt inside. As long as I was always ready to wait on all the men, hand and foot, day and night, year in, year out. <laughs> More coffee, anyone? No, 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 no just have a seat. Fraser and Martin do treat her better than her family does, so that's just kind of the role that she falls into. Daphne is a sweet source of comic relief and definitely fills out the cast in a refreshing way. <laughs> Aren't you the cutest little thing? Oh, 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 yeah, give me a kiss, give me a kiss. Oh, oh I love you too. Oh. There, happy now. <laughs> Ross, how can you just toss him aside after such a tender display of affection? I can do it with men too. <laughs> And finally, Roz Doyle, who is played by Perry Gilpin, is Fraser's producer. She is witty, has quite the love life, and no shame about it. There's some advice I need. About what? A subject in which you're quite well versed, sex. How can I help you? What do you do when, when the romance goes out of a relationship? I get dressed and go home. <laughs> that does make her the butt of many promiscuity jokes. The label says it's famously spreadable. Funny, Roz, doesn't your label say the same thing? <laughs> what does yours say, Niles? May cause drowsiness? <laughs> Is there no place I can go without running into some guy I've dated? I was reading about a Trappist monastery in the Amazon that they somehow built into the treetop. <laughs> Shut up, you big doily. 
She stays true to herself, voices what she wants, doesn't take shit from anyone. She has a pretty thick skin, but later on we do see some moments of true vulnerability between her and Fraser. Fraser and Roz also have a strained relationship at first, but become close as time goes on. Niles and Roz have a rocky relationship with him just constantly forgetting who she is and her taking delight in lobbying insults at him. That's a nice jacket. Thank you. It's offbeat. <laughs> What is that supposed to mean, offbeat? Well, no, wait, I think I know exactly what it means. Offbeat isn't cheap. Well, excuse me for not being rich enough to shop at the International House of Tidass like you and Maris the heiress. <laughs> that is what you meant, right? Yes, but I had no idea you'd pick up on it. Roz is very hardworking, independent, and confident in her abilities. Though not acknowledged by Fraser, the success of his show is in large part due to her producing skills. Also, she's possibly bisexual or bi-curious at least. Oh, you too, huh? I, I thought I sensed a little spark between us, Roz. A spark? <laughs> Maybe after the show we could get a drink or uh, have some dinner? Ah. Uh. You like Italian? <laughs> I'd make out with Roz. In a later season, Roz becomes pregnant and struggles to adapt to the major changes that her pregnancy brings to her social life and appearance and body. It, it sounds to me as if each suitor possesses one quality that you admire. Rather than choose among them, why not try to find one person who fits all your criteria? Why don't you call back when you're a working single mother whose choice in dates is between a guy with eight teeth and a guy whose hair is painted on? <laughs> But later, she embraces these things and proclaims that she loves the more stable life that she's carved out for herself. I mean, I'm 38, and I feel 38. Now, I know we're all supposed to act like perpetual teenagers these days, but you know what? I like acting my age. I like being a mom. I like having a career. And I like balancing my checkbook. When did it become such a bad thing to be an adult? Dr. Crane, hello? Look, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I had a great time when I was younger, I did, but after a while, that way of life just seems empty. I may have to go deeper and commit to things that really matter to you. The arc where she gets pregnant had a lot of potential. We do see some real emotional moments and growth. You know, this is something that's gonna drastically change her life. And not only is she going to be a parent, she decides to be a single mother as well and not involve the father in the child's life. Although it does seem, especially as time goes on, that the writers didn't really know what to do with her now that her daughter was born. Again, kind of like Daphne, she's toned way down as the series goes on, but it makes a little bit more sense because now she is a mom. Oh, and finally, finally, we have Eddie, Martin's dog. It's time he learned what it's like to be stared at all the time. <laughs> Bring it on, Buster, you got nothing. <laughs> you can't touch me, I'm go. <laughs> Eddie is played by Moose and later his son Enzo. Enzo is actually one of the puppies seen in the second season episode where Eddie fathers puppies. He does some amazing tricks on this show. Someone give this dog an award. He came in flying down, just running so fast and he stopped right there and he looked at me and I could see in his eyes and as a matter of fact, we could all see, he went blank, just completely forgot what he had to do, but did not want to disappoint me. So he ran all by himself, all his tricks. So he started circling, barking, waving, you know, is that, is that what you want? Is that what you want? And went through the whole repertoire. He apparently was the biggest diva on set. John Mahoney said that they would apply liver pate behind their ears so the dog would nuzzle them because Moose never really took to any of them. Kelsey Grammer even says that Moose would bite John Mahoney, which I don't know if that's been confirmed or not. Um, but Moose and Enzo, father and son, could not be in the same room, kind of mirroring the show with Fraser and Martin. There are some other notable side characters. Lilith, Fraser's ex-wife, who is the sexiest person on the show. I would make out with Lilith. Bibi Glazer, Fraser's agent. Kenny Daly, the station manager in later seasons. And Noel Shemsky, who goes on one date with Roz and uh, is in love with her for the rest of the show. He's very creepy. Hi, Dr. Crane. He's <laughs> driving me crazy. Hi, Dr. Crane. Did you sign this petition? It's to the 
talented producers of Star Trek, suggesting a new character. The all-powerful space vixen, Rosalinda. Four-breasted queen of the planet Rosniak. I'll sign that. She never returns those feelings. She's constantly like, leave me alone. Um, it's kind of stalkerish. He's pretty harmless, but again, uh, creepy. There are some really funny moments though between him and Bulldog because Bulldog, oh, I forgot Bulldog. I mentioned him in Fraser's character section. He's uh, the sports guy at KACL. This stinks! This is total BS! This stinks! This stinks! This stinks! This stinks! This is total BS! Uh, ladies man, harasser, kind of pretty thick headed in that he uses his head to uh, get stuff from vending machines. He has some real moments, um, but yeah, I mean, he's just not really a great guy. Anyway, obviously they're competing over Roz. Noel's reactions to him are pretty funny. You took me under your wing. It's crowded under there. <laughs> I will kill you. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't have any problem with you being my boss. After all, I know what it feels like to be underneath you. Am I right? <laughs> Watch what you say about it! No. Right. One adversary to Frasier is Cam Winston. He's the upstairs neighbor and is a lot like Frasier in many ways. He competes with him at the condo board. They kind of always like to mess with each other. What is it? It's a bill from Cam. Apparently turning off his water has ruined the clothes or in his washing machine. Those clothes were already ruined just by being on Cam Winston. <laughs> uh, making complaints about each other, holding parties and not inviting each other. Typical rivalry stuff. Fine. I will arrange an introduction to my sweater weaver. Good. Thank you. But then I must insist on the formula to your bath blend. I think we were closer on an earlier draft. Concur. I actually ship Cam and Fraser, enemies to lovers, slow burn, 50K words. Is that how fan fiction do? There's also a lot of celebrity guest stars on the show. Stars from Cheers, like Ted Danson, Woody Harrelson, and Shelley Long. Some other notable guest stars are Bill Gates, Patrick Stewart, Dr. Phil, and Laura Linney. Frasier radio show callers were actually celebrity cameos who lent their voices for those small parts. Some of these were Reba McIntyre, Matthew Broderick, Eddie Van Halen. The rest are in the credits of each season's finale. My favorite celebrity guest star episode is Wheels of Fortune with Michael Keaton, which I won't spoil for you, but it has like like the best twist ending I've ever seen. Michael Keaton's just also really funny. Frage, you know, what I was going to say if you'd let me finish was somehow the Lord will provide. Mm. And by the way, Matthew, John, Thomas, Bartholomew, Jude, Judas, two Jameses, Andrew, Peter, Simon, the Zealot, and Philip. 9.50 to go past the potatoes, please. <laughs> okay, and that's it. That's the characters. I did it. And next we'll talk about the heart of the show. I'm just trying to do the right thing here. I'm trying to be the good son. Oh, don't worry, son. After I'm gone, you can live guilt-free knowing you've done right by your papa. You think that's what this is all about? Guilt, isn't it? Of course it is! <laughs> but the point is, I did it. I took you in and I got news for you. I wanted to do it because you're my father. And how do you repay me? Ever since you moved in here, it's been a snide comment about this or a smart little put down about that. Well, I've done my best to make a home here for you. And once, just once, would it have killed you to say thank you? One lousy thank you. There are two main emotional arcs that I return to throughout the seasons, what I call the heart of the show. Those are Fraser and Martin's father-son relationship and Niles and Daphne's slow burn romance. Interestingly, one is about two people who want nothing to do with each other and are forced to live together, and the other is two people who are unable to be together, eventually falling in love. First, let's talk about Fraser and Martin. To put it simply, Fraser and Martin do not get along. They are at odds with each other constantly, especially in the first two seasons. They are both stubborn, hot-headed, and can't resist the snide remarks about the other. Oh, how should I expect anything out of you? You are the most cold, 
intractable, unapproachable, distant, stubborn, cold man I've ever known. You said cold twice, Mr. Egghead. Egghead! Egghead! Martin and Fraser's battles often escalate to yelling, lobbing insults at each other. It's no wonder that it takes years of tolerating and learning about each other to undo the damage done by the hostility seen in the show, not to mention whatever had happened years before. Their interests are very different, so there are few activities to bond with each other over. Fraser attempts to go ice fishing, attends basketball games, goes hunting, but Fraser and Niles also try to change their father so he's easier for them to deal with, which is unsuccessful, no matter how many Armani suits they buy him. Then there are the battles over the chair. Excuse me, excuse me, wait a minute. Where do you want it? Where's the TV? It's, it's in that credenza. Point it at that thing. Look, Dad, as dear as I'm sure that this piece is to you, I, I just don't think it, it goes with anything here. I know, it's eclectic. <laughs> To Fraser, it symbolizes an encroachment upon his territory, something that frustrates his attempts at the life he wants. Fraser will throw a blanket over it or attempt to move it out of the room because he fears what people will think when they see it. To Martin, it's an important piece of home that he holds on to. In the most intense battle over the chair, both Martin and Fraser accuse each other of intentionally ruining the chair or the carpet and have no trust that both situations are accidents. This was not malicious, it was an accident. I don't think you know the difference. Yes, I do. That was an accident! This is malicious! <laughs> you could have killed someone! It was an accident! You said there are no accidents! <laughs> I know you're angry right now, and that's normal. I'll tell you what, the healthiest thing you can do right you wanna now... Wanna know the healthiest thing you can do? Shut my yap! Bingo! <laughs> This tells me that the hostility was built up for so long that they were already looking for evidence that the other was antagonizing them. There's very little trust between them. One reason for the friction between the two is that they don't actually know each other very well. Frazier especially struggles to let go of his preconceived notions of his father. Frazier is unable to accept that he can't beat his father at chess and that he may not actually be smarter than him. Checkmate, Schwarzkopf. <laughs> And again, we've established that Fraser and Niles are both very intellectual, cultured, intelligent people. And Martin has a lot of street smarts, but they also must have gotten that intelligence from somewhere and it didn't all come from their mother. When Niles discovers that one of their parents had an affair when they were children, Martin takes the fall to protect the image of Hester, their mother. You wanna know the truth? Fine. I had an affair. It happened a long time ago and it's not anything I'm proud of. This leads to Martin and Fraser bonding over the spouses that cheated on them. Why didn't you tell me it was mom? Because it was none of your damn business and it still isn't. Look, Dad, I don't blame you for being defensive, but, but I had a right to know. If your information, this sort of thing happens to a lot of people. But if it's any consolation, I know exactly how you feel. Lilith did the same thing to me. Lilith had an affair? It's the most painful and humiliating experience of my entire life. I'm sure you felt the same way. Well, I hadn't thought about it for quite some time, but thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Martin is also prone to holding grudges, which doesn't help the progression of their relationship. Let me see if I got this right. In the last year, you give my chair away, you lose my dog, and now you demolish my bar. What's next? I'm gonna find out you're the one who shot me in the hip. Deep down, both Martin and Fraser want their relationship to be better. Fraser initiates by trying to engage his father in conversation about their feelings, which Martin usually dismisses. Go. This is stupid. <laughs> one second, that's our personal best. After years of living with each other, they become like an old married couple. I can solve your little problem. I'll be right there. <laughs> As usual. Frazier has to save the day. <laughs> As usual, Martin has to hear about it. There are a couple of opportunities where Martin could go elsewhere, like to live with Niles or to a retirement home, but Frazier doesn't want him to. We've both been a little cranky. It's probably just the rain. No, Dad, listen, listen. I, I want us to go to games together. I, I really do. And I, I want us to see movies and, and uh, go drinking at McGinty. Well, that's great, son. No, Dad, Dad, I'm trying to say something here. I'm not ready for you to leave. I, I don't want you to move in here. I'd miss you too much. It is very heartwarming seeing the growth and seeing the difference in how they interact with each other in the final episodes versus flipping back to the beginning and just the friction and the headbutting. Thank you, Fraser, for, well, you know. 
you want to get me out of here, and then you can have your own space, and I'll have my own space, and we can put an end to all this bickering. I guess it wasn't so hard to say after all. Except for one thing. I'm not going. <laughs> what? Look, you want us to forge some great father-son relationships to make some connection. Well, that kind of thing takes a couple of years, not a couple of days, doesn't it? You're the shrink. A couple of years, huh? Ah, oh, it'll go by before you know it. Either that or it'll seem like eternity. <laughs> In the end, Martin was right. It does take years in order to build a relationship with someone. And by the end, Frazier and Martin surprisingly have the relationship that they'd always wanted. And it's not perfect, but uh, it would have been such a tragedy if it had not been built, how much he would have missed out on with his dad. And I just think that's really sweet. Hard and so I fell in love with you Hard and so The way a fool would do Madly Because you held me tight And stole a kiss in the night <laughs> Niles falls for Daphne instantly after meeting her. Despite his clumsy, obvious infatuation with her, Daphne is completely oblivious to his feelings. Niles and Daphne have natural chemistry between the two of them. Niles is often flustered, attempting to be coy, while Daphne is just happy to be there. You know, it's always so obvious when a man likes a woman. <laughs> you can just tell by his awkward body language. <laughs> Shifting in his chair. <laughs> He doesn't know quite what to do with his hands. <laughs> He's as nervous as a hen. Oh, for God's sake, stop fidgeting. The two become close friends quite quickly, but Niles never works up the courage to tell Daphne directly that he's in love with her. There are a few moments that he's given the opportunity, but he either chickens out at the last moment or doesn't clarify when Daphne misunderstands. Do you know how frustrating it is to be completely in love with someone, not be able to tell her how you feel? Sorry, I, I just came back for the fabric softener. I didn't mean... I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, this woman you're so in love with, who is she? You didn't hear that part, did you? <laughs> no, so come on. What's her name? You can't back out now. Her name just happens to be... That Phyllis. <laughs> oh, I've never heard that name. That Phyllis. <laughs> This is probably for the best because Daphne doesn't realize she has feelings for him or develops feelings for him in return until he's already with Mel, his second wife, and is starting to get over her, so he tells himself. With Daphne being so oblivious to Niles' infatuation with her, the reveal may have been too sudden or too jarring for her to handle, and she might have politely friend-zoned him and crushed him in the process. This results in the tension between Niles and Daphne building until everything is revealed in the seventh season. Again, spoilers. I, I'm talking in depth about the show, so I, I'm just gonna, I'm sorry. All of this happens while Daphne is dating Donnie, which of course brings Niles a great deal of agony. He just doesn't see what Daphne sees in Donnie, and I honestly don't either, but he's just very upset. And then later on, of course, he meets Mel, and then he's like, oh, I'm good now. Frazier, who is high on medication uh, for his ailing back, accidentally tells Daphne that Niles is in love with her, and Martin accidentally confirms it. I overheard him say he's in love with me. Jeez, not this. You knew about this? I'm not getting in the middle of this. Then it's true. Look, I kept my mouth shut for six years. I'm not saying anything now. When I said to your father, Dr. Crane's in love with me, he said it's been going on for six years now. What did he mean by that? Oh, that. He meant Niall. What? Niall. He's crazy about you. This comes as quite a shock to her, and her demeanor around Niall's changes, which he notices immediately. Good evening, Daphne. Dr. Crane. You look different somehow. Have you done something new with your hair? Oh. Oh, that must be it. 
The focus shifts away from Niles' perspective to Daphne's feelings as she processes this information. We spend less time in Niles' head as a result. Up until this point, Daphne, again, kind of becomes like the sexy lamp in some scenes where she's just kind of projected onto, and we spend a lot of time with Niles as he wrestles with his infatuation with her and how he just can't seem to bring himself to tell her how he feels. All of this tension is building as Daphne and Donnie get engaged and are going to be married. The reason why Daphne is so distraught is because she's about to be married and she gets this, again, bombshell of information that for six or seven years, Niles has been pining after her. After the reveal, this shift goes on to Daphne. We don't really know what he thinks or what he's feeling. We just kind of see him mostly from the outside and he's with Mel, he seems to be happy. He hints a little bit that there are still lingering feelings for Daphne, but he assures Fraser that that's over. Daphne has been trying to just avoid Niles. She doesn't want him to have feelings for her. She doesn't want him to bring it up. She's kind of just avoiding it. Daphne becomes uncomfortable when Niles wants to speak to her privately, anxious about having to reject him, and insists on saying her piece first, but then realizes she can't. I know that... Yes? I'm sorry, I... Look, uh, why don't I start? Uh, no, Dr. Crane. No, no, I, I really need to say this. I can't wait any longer. Daphne? Yes? Uh, this is so difficult for me. Yes? I need my Christmas present back. You want? I love that at this point, we don't really know it, what it is that she's realizing or what she's thinking, but it's clear that there's again another shift. From then on, we see hints of Daphne's inner struggle. She talks about the impulses we'd like to explore. We live in a civilized society and there are certain rules we have to live by. We all have impulses we'd like to explore, but we don't. Daphne? Well, you can't just go chasing anyone you fancy just because you're suddenly attracted to them. There are certain things you don't do, no matter how tempted you are. She also gets drunk off of Bloody Marys and tells Niles how Mel is all wrong for him. And Martin and Fraser are a little suspicious. It's a little bit odd. But again, they don't pay attention to Daphne a lot. <laughs> now, I won't spoil the episode where Daphne and Niles do admit their feelings for each other. I think it does a good job of being emotionally satisfying and wrapping things up. So I'll let you watch it on your own. These are the episodes right here. This obviously means that there's another shift in the continuum of the show. I hope I'm using that word right. Niles and Daphne are together. Now what? Well, frustratingly, they still have some hoops to jump through. Donnie is distraught, and rightfully so, and Niles still has to divorce Mel, who he eloped with shortly before Daphne and Donnie's wedding. Niles feels guilty for the position he put Mel in and wants to avoid another long, difficult divorce that he had with Maris, so he complies with her demands that they act as if they are still happily married. For the next few weeks, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, we're still happily married. Check. We will appear together in public at various social occasions. Check. In private, I don't want to lay eyes on you. Check, check. However, this turns out to just be a tool that Mel uses to torment him and ruin his reputation. I have gone along with this charade because I hurt you, but now you're just dragging it out to be vindictive. I'm not going to tolerate it any longer. Oh, really? And what are you going to do about it? Keep pushing me, you'll find out. And during this time, Daphne and Niles have to sneak around. They can't be seen in public. They're driving to his apartment with Daphne hiding under piles of coats and blankets, <laughs> which is frustrating for her. I mean, she just wants to be with this person. Once Niles finally stands up to Mel, the two are finally free to be together in public. No, Mel, why don't you listen for once? I'm through. I'll tell you when you're through, you spineless twit, and you're not even close. That's it, Mel, I'm sick of these games. Niles, don't make a scene. I don't care. I love Daphne and I'm not putting her through this torture another second. This sham of a marriage is over. But another relationship hurdle is introduced. Niles and Daphne now have to confront seven years worth of pining and fantasies from Niles' end. And that does affect their relationship. Daphne is overwhelmed by this, while Niles stays stuck in the fantasy and doesn't see Daphne as she really is. Look at us, we're, we're magnificent together. We're moving in perfect sync. There's that word perfect again. I know what you're thinking. Just because this evening was perfect doesn't mean I'm idealizing Daphne. Niles, did you hear yourself out there? You called her a goddess. You can't build a higher pedestal than that. Who could possibly compete with that sort of image? Both are scared to disappoint each other, especially after taking such extreme actions to be together. It's once again Fraser's interference that forces Niles to realize that he needs to let go of the Daphne that he's built up in his head. The only thing I am guilty of is loving Daphne, and that's all I've ever done. Yes. Yes, and how did you love her? From afar. You are never in love with her. You are in love at her. Now you've been given a chance to experience her in a real, 
relationship, and yet for some reason you're resisting it. Rather than see her as she really is, you keep holding on to the fantasy. Even though the way the show handles this, and I'll get there, because it's kind of ridiculous, I'm glad that they acknowledge that it's awkward for them to finally transition from friends to lovers in such a short amount of time, and that Niles' fantasies would cause problems. Niles and Daphne don't really suffer from the same Jim and Pam problem, where the writers didn't really know what to do with them, though I will admit we don't follow Niles and Daphne as far past their marriage like we do with Jim and Pam. But also like, how does Daphne not just like at least pick up the vibe? How does she not notice? Like maybe she just friend zones him so hard that she doesn't even consider it. I'm also mad. I'm mad that Daphne gets a better proposal from Donnie than she does from Niles. You told me that your dad and you used to sit on your stoop and do the same thing when you were a kid. He said that the only man good enough for you would scoop the stars out of the sky with his hat and Lay them at your feet. I've only caught this one so far, but if you'll accept it, I'll spend my life chasing down the rest of them for you. Daphne Moon, will you and your beautiful toes? Oh, here's a quote from David Hyde Pierce that I found on my fair Fraser Instagram. It was such a great idea. This weird neurotic mess of a man and this beautiful, exquisite, fragrant, psychic Englishwoman. Her obliviousness to his attention was partially due to her ignorance of her own worth. That's what made it so beautiful. That's cute. Niles and Daphne are truly made better by being together. Niles worships the person he's with and Daphne deserves to be worshiped. Both have been mistreated and taken for granted in their previous relationships. And although at times it's agonizing, I think it's one of the best slow burn romances I've ever seen. Niles and Daphne's romance is vital to the heart of the show and their relationship is an example of patience, courage, and enduring love. They are transformed as they find their way to each other, becoming unrecognizable from the people they were when they met and living what years before seemed to be only a fantasy. So where are you from? Manchester, England. Oh my. Big family. Hideously. <laughs> and you? Uh, I'm from a small mountain village in Tibet. <laughs> Tenzing Norge used to carry me to school. <laughs> no, but I've always wondered. Thank you for watching this video. I have worked on it for so long. It is a huge project. I have put so much heart into it, more than any other project I've worked on. <laughs> Um, this really means a lot to me. This is just part one. The second part will be out relatively soon, so hopefully you can be patient and stay tuned for that. Subscribe if you haven't already. Go ahead and give this video a like. Check down below for more fun Fraser content. <laughs> and with that, double thumbs up, finger guns, high five. <laughs>